Hello and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this programme today we'll be discussing the horrific murder of uh, Jomma Lee Rigby uh, who was uh, murdered uh, brutally by uh, two Nigerian Christian converts to Islam in the streets of uh, London. We'll be looking at the implications and also acknowledging that this is the first terrorist attack that uh, the capital has faced since those dreadful days of 7-7 back in July of 2005. So we'll be discussing what are the implications of these attacks, why were these attacks carried out, and how can we confront what is seen as a growing radicalization that's taking place amongst so many young British Muslims. And uh, also, how can our Western leaders and our media understand the conflict that we're facing unless we really identify the problem? So it's my special guest to be joining today, Professor Alan Johnson, who's the editor of Fathom magazine and a research fellow at BICOM. And also we'll be joined by Skype later on the programme with Ryan Munro, who's a national security analyst. Alan, it's, it's good to have you back on the Middle East Report. It's, it's almost like uh, you're part of the furniture and, and a regular on this programme now, which is wonderful. But uh, can you share with our viewers the very important work that you've done in the Home Office in actually um, confronting and dealing with this uh, growing and dangerous Islamist threat and certainly the radicalization of uh, young impressionable British Muslims. I worked as a consultant with the Home Office for a couple of years between 2008 to 2010 and my task was to interview about 25 young British Muslims, men and women, who'd got themselves involved in extremism. Sometimes this was non-violent extremism within Britain, organizations such as Hizbut Tahrir, and sometimes it was they'd gone off to foreign lands and with guns in their hands had shot them off. So what distinguished all of them, though, was that they'd got themselves out of extremism, have became disillusioned and exited. And we tried to understand by talking to them at great length why they got involved, who recruited them, what arguments were used to persuade them, why those arguments lost their appeal, and they found themselves leaving those organizations. So what were some of the lessons that you learned personally uh, by working for this Home Office task force? Well, I think to frame it positively to begin with, one of the things I learned was that I don't think this is a serious form of politics that's going to dominate either this Muslim community or, or any other Muslim community in Europe. We're talking very much about minority affair. That doesn't mean it's not very dangerous, as we saw with the... Uh, but terrible butchering of um, the soldier, but it does mean we need to put it in some kinds of context. So, for instance, I think a very small percentage of British Muslims say that 7-7 was fully justified. I think some 6%, but still, that's worrying. That 6%, when asked that question in the aftermath of 7-7, said it was fully justified. It translates to around 100,000 Muslims. I don't think for a moment in Britain 100,000 Muslims um, are, are that extreme, but what it does tell us is that there's a pool of opinion, a pool of alienation, and often resentment towards the West, which can be tapped into by Islamist recruiters. And that was really the second lesson that, that we learned from the project, was that... Often in the aftermath of an attack, you'll hear, you'll hear the expression lone wolf men mentioned. Is this a lone wolf? If you look at all of the attacks, there have been for sure maybe one or two around the world that are genuinely lone wolf attacks. Mostly it's a myth. Mostly what happens without exception is that an Islamist recruiter is on the prowl, spots a young Muslim who is disillusioned, angry, alienated, and what they do is they connect up the alienation or anger of the young Muslim with the Islamist political ideology, which is also rooted in a certain interpretation of Islam. And it's that combination of the anger of the younger person, however misplaced, and the recruiter's message. When, you've, when you put those two together, you can get a, a recruit who's willing sometimes to, to go on and do violence. Mm. I, I must say from, from the onset at the start of this program that this is a difficult program to do because we're dealing with uh, extremely sensitive issues. 
um, particularly anything where race and religion actually mix is, is a kind of sometimes a very much of a lethal cocktail. But having watched certainly the events unfold um, after the death of John uh, Lee Rigby, the aftermath, um, the uh, the politicians, the government spokesmen, the media reporting on this one, I, I felt it was time that we should actually do a program addressing these issues because I felt that, you know, the sense that the truth wasn't being portrayed and uh, anyone watching would have a totally different view of the real threats and the challenges that we face. But firstly, um, before we start to go in a bit more detail on this one, Alan, I'd certainly want to know your views of, of what you thought about the hideous, hideous attack on uh, drummer Lee Rigby, because as I think it was just after I recorded a, a programme with you um, talking about... Uh, Sorry, the uh, scientist uh, Stephen mm, Hawking Steve boycott Hawking. Of, uh, of Israel, and, uh, uh, boycott of Israel, and I was driving home listening to uh, Radio Five Live when the report came through. Now they they said that a soldier had been attacked in the streets, and essentially, as soon as I knew that, I knew that was Islamist uh, attack on this one. And they didn't actually say it on on Radio Five Live, primarily for legal reasons, probably. But you can tell the nature of the attack that it was. Um, what do you think the impact of this attack will be? Um, on not only on the Muslim community, but also what kind of message does it send out to the wider community? Well, I think like you and like everybody who, who heard about the events, I, I was profoundly shocked. It's, um, it's a genuinely shocking event that that's happened. Um, then what shocked me over the next 24 hours or so was the inability of much of our media and many of our politicians to face up to some realities. The realities being that on the day in the aftermath, the, the, at the time the killer shouted, Allah Akbar, God is great, they, they stayed around the scene and they quoted um, canonical Islamic sources and so on. Today, in court, this morning, the first appearance of one of the killers, he um, blew a kiss to someone in the gallery, pointed up to the skies, and he had a Quran in his hand. I mean, these, these, these people are not trying to hide at all the connection as they say it, Many, many Muslims would say dis this distorted version of Islam, but they see a connection themselves between Islam and what they did. And it's up to us, I think, to, to face up to that, to engage in the debate honestly and openly about the relationship there is between Islam and how it is that some people can do such a terrible thing and think in their heads, not saying they're legitimate, but in their heads that they're somehow doing what um, Islamic teaching tells them to do. That's a discussion we really have to have now. What shocked me uh, the most was the brutality and the barbaric way in which the soldier Lee Rigby was not only run over, but was also then had his head hacked off with a meat cleaver and a knife in broad daylight in the streets of London. Um, what kind of message were the terror suspects trying to send out? What kind of message were they trying to give uh, not only their fellow uh, Islamists, but also Britain as a whole? Well, I think what was interesting on the day was that the killers wanted media attention. Um, Con Coughlin, writing in The Telegraph the day later, said this was, it was a classic Al-Qaeda attack in the sense that it was very much media-orientated. Uh, they, they didn't try to save themselves, they didn't try to run away, they wanted people to take photographs of themselves, they sought out cameras to talk to. So it's a sense in which these terrorist attacks are, are valuable to them to the extent that they get media attention. Um, we have to, uh, you were right to start off by saying we need to be very careful in these discussions. The vast majority of Muslims, I think, in this country were absolutely appalled by what they saw that day, the vast, vast majority. But I think one of the things we need to start talking about is what did these guys who did that terrible crime on the day think? What was going on in their heads in terms of them thinking themselves as, as good Muslims when they were carrying that out? And s some people have tried to raise this, a series of aspects of both theology and history which we need to be aware of, which make it not easy but possible for the jihadists, the violent Islamists, the killers that we saw, to find warrant or some sort of basis for what they do in, in the teaching. So we need to start talking about the, for instance, the, there's a radical supersessionist part of Islamic theology, which says not only that it's another religion alongside others, but that it has superseded, it's the final revelation. This has not always, but often, given Islam a difficult relationship with Judaism and with Christianity. 
Samuel Huntington, the writer, talks about Islam's bloody borders, that where Islam butts up against other religions, we do tend to see, see conflict. That, that's one factor. I think another factor is the, the text itself. The text is, the, of the Quran is supposed to be unmediated, direct, dictated, syllable by syllable. It isn't simply inspired. So it's very difficult to look at these texts from the 7th century and to reform them, to adapt them to the modern world and so on. That's a real challenge for Muslims to think about how they adapt those canonical texts to, to the modern world that they live in. And also this is a question of the conception of God himself almost is at stake here. This is not God the Father, it's not Emmanuel, it's not a God who has a personal reciprocal relationship um, with people. It's an omnipotent God of absolute will who demands submission. Islam means submission, isn't it? it doesn't mean peace, it means submission. Now, it, that's not to say that you know, generations of Muslims haven't um, with great spirituality and a focus on social justice and peaceable behavior, founded um, great civilizations and great relationships to other cultures. That's absolutely true. But the jihadists are able to focus on some aspects of the theology, which then make it possible for them, I think, to, to believe at least to themselves that they're carrying out God's will. And just to add in the historical factor is that Islam has had what some people call a predicament with modernity, a predicament with the modern world. It hasn't fully adapted the religion to the enlightenment, to reason, to rationality, to science, to the industrial revolution, to new technologies, to pluralism, to women's equality, to all sorts of aspects of the modern world. This has created a, first of all, an intra-Islamic struggle, a conflict within Islam. Most of the killing of, of the terrorists is of Muslims by Muslims. And his, until relatively recently, that was the case. Mm -hmm. What we're experiencing in the West is a spillover of that intra-Islamic conflict around the, the soul of the religion, really, as it adapts to the modern world. We're, we're looking at the spillover of that to our world in the West in the context of globalization, immigration, new technologies, the shrinking of the world that the new communications technologies create, and also a, a political decision which was made by bin Laden and his cohorts to say, we're not going to attack the enemy, the, 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 the enemy, the near enemy as they called it, which was those Muslims who were wrong in their opinion, the apostate Muslims who, who didn't have the right form of the religion, we'll, we'll attack the far away enemy, which was the West, which was Israel, and, and so on. And, and that's the events we've seen since, in, in this country, particularly since 7-7. Now, I'm not saying for a moment that there's something in the DNA of any religion or any set of ideas that means people have to act in a certain way. But I am saying that I think the time has long passed when we can simply have a ritual condemnation of a murder and move on. I think there's a real agenda for us of um, tackling the sort of issues uh, in theology and in politics and in culture which are under, underpinning some of these terrible events. I mean, uh, in the days that uh, preceded the, this horrendous attack on uh, Jomla uh, Lee Rigby, and our, our hearts and our prayers definitely go out to his family and his friends, and also the uh, brave and courageous soldiers who put their lives on the line for our security. Um, and they do a tremendous job. It, it's something that I think we, we have to identify is that uh, people like Armand Chaudhry and others for um, other uh, extreme uh, Islamic groups that have appeared on the media in recent days have come back and said that the reason why we were, we were attacked and the reason why Lee Rigby was attacked was because of our foreign policy involvement in Afghanistan, our previous involvement in Iraq and our support for Israel. But surely um, this goes against the grain in a sense that what they were trying to do and what they want to do is to implement Sharia law, establish the Islamic caliphate and create an Islamic one world government, an Islamic system of government. So fundamentally, we're already dealing with a completely different political system with aims and ideology. I think you're right. Um, one of the problems that Islam has had to wrestle with is the fusion of religious and temporal authority in the founding moment of the religion itself. People sometimes use an expression, Muhammad was his own Constantine, in the sense that the development of the Christian religion into the Holy Roman Empire, uh, with Constantine forming a political wing of the religion and so on, that, that comes centuries after the founding moment. 
for Islam, it's different. Muhammad is, is a holy warrior. There's a form of conflict and war and violence which is seen as simultaneously pious. And this has created some difficulties. One of the difficulties it's created is, whereas, for instance, in Christianity, you know, we have the notion of one renders to, to, to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And this is underpinned a fundamental separation between church and state and the ability to, to coexist in secular societies. It's not that that's totally missing in Islam, but it's, it's, it's easy for the radicals to say that it's not there and that um, such, a, such a notion is itself impious, such a notion of a separate human realm, which is other than the enactment of the Sharia law, which is in the God-given Quran, it, it is an affront to God. So there's a real um, question there of how we, we, we take that up and... Um, make sure that it's possible for Muslims to believe it. it is possible to render to the country that they're part of what, what is the countries and the democracies and the rule of law and so on. Now, the vast majority of Muslims do that very well. They do it very comfortably. Um, but it's a case, I think, of leveraging in at the level of principle and argument and debate within uh, the Muslim world how those people manage to, to do that. We, in terms of foreign policy itself, I mean, briefly, some of the points that I think should be made are foreign policy is not anti-Islam. Western foreign policy has not been and is not anti-Islam. Sometimes I think people concede this argument too easily, and then they say, ah, yes, but it doesn't justify violence. Let's, let's go back a step. It isn't anti-Muslim in any way at all. It, the rescue of the Kuwaitis from Saddam was a rescue of Muslims. The rescue of the Kosovans from the Serbs was a rescue of Muslims. And sometimes the West can't win either way. It didn't intervene um, when the Serbs were attacking the Bosnians. It was attacked for not intervening, and that was anti-Muslim. It intervened when to, to rescue the Kosovans, and that was seen as somehow an anti-Muslim intervention too. It's, it's almost impossible uh, to win. I think what we can say, which is um, we do have to concede something. I, I think my view would be we do have to concede there is a, a history of foreign policy which is relevant. I don't think it's the bits that they think are relevant. I don't think it's about recent foreign policy, but I think it's about two phases. One would be in the aftermath of the First World War, the Western colonialist powers, as it would be seen, really carved up the Middle East and drew a series of straight line countries, which we're now seeing the breakup of. Most of the events of the, after the Arab Spring is the collapse of those straight line states that were drawn by the Western powers after the First World War. There's that moment. And I think the second moment is when the Western powers, I think mistakenly, for the sake of stability, for the sake of the steady supply of energy sources and so on, all too easily supported the autocrats and the dictators who, who really had no concern for the ordinary people in the region. So whether that was Mubarak or Gaddafi or others, the West was seen as having sided with them. And the Islamists would use these two phases, the, the, the carve-up of the Middle East after the First World War and the support for the dictators after the Second World War, and they would attract support on that basis. Now, ironically, breaking away from that at this moment and going for a freedom agenda, which I support, the difficulty is we're doing it at exactly the moment when the, the liberals are weak, the autocrats are falling, and the Islamists are strong. So the Islamists are, are making most of this moment of the freedom agenda, and we need to adapt to that, I think, in terms of who we support and how we support them. Absolutely. And uh, we've got a clip to go to now. It's called Jama Lee Rigby's Cause of Death Has Now Been Confirmed. The thousands of floral tributes show better than any words could possibly tell how deeply this community and indeed nation feels about the killing of drummer Lee Rigby. My family of uh, Royal Artillery background and it just, I felt like I had to just come and say how sorry I was. At the end of the day that could have been me, that could have been my son-in-law actually serves in his barracks now. My daughter lives a stone's throw from here. One week after his murder, one of the suspects, 22-year-old Michael Adibawale, is being questioned by the Met Police's Counter-Terrorism Command. The other suspect, Michael Adibalajo, remains in hospital. Today, the police were back in Woolwich, appealing for information about drummer Rigby's death. We would urge anybody who witnessed Lee's attack or who has other information that would assist this investigation to come forward. Officers handed leaflets to passing motorists and pedestrians in this busy part of London. Specifically, they're keen to learn more about the car used in the incident, a blue Vauxhall Tigra, and background information on the suspects. Among those paying tribute today, Ingrid Lue Kennett, the cub leader, who bravely and calmly spoke to the suspects in the aftermath of the killing. Very emotional, huge response from the British public, and uh, just to say how we are 
behind me, our army, and, uh, and say, yes, we want to stand for it. It's not here. There are regular armies. If you want to fight, don't kill like this. As the quest for information into what happened here steps up, the coroner has revealed his findings from the post-mortem on drummer Rigby, concluding that he died from multiple incised wounds and not, it would seem, the impact of the car. Tim Cooper, Forces News, Woolwich. Welcome back to the Middle East Report. We're now joined by Skype uh, from the United States by Ryan Morrow, who is a national uh, security analyst with the Clarion Project. Uh, Ryan, it's great to have you on the uh, Middle East Report today. Thanks for having me back. No, it's an absolute pleasure. Uh, Ryan, can you first of all describe what you interpret uh, the events of almost two weeks ago in which drummer Lee Rigby uh, was brutally murdered here in the streets of London? Well, it shows an increasing problem that we're going to face in the future simply because of mathematics. You can have that very, very radical minority of Muslims, but because the number of Muslims overall is increasing, you're going to have an increasing number of incidents like this. Um, it, this definitely doesn't represent the Muslim community as a whole, but this is a problem that we're going to have to deal with. And it speaks to the fact that we need to deal with ideology, because if we just focus on when these individuals get weapons, when they try to carry out a terrorist attack, then we're going to fail. We're not going to always be able to detect that. So we have to combat the ideology and embrace the moderate Muslims that can help discredit it. Uh, and Ryan, what's been uh, your pressure on the other side of the Atlantic um, about this uh, uh, hideous uh, terrorist attack in broad daylight, that which we saw with the death and the murder of uh, John Malie Rigby? Well, it shocked the American people, and that's because it was on videotape. The fact that they were carrying their weapons and they were talking to uh, people with video cameras with blood on their hands. That is something that's going to penetrate the media, that's going to capture the attention of the American people. But what I was disappointed in was the very little coverage there was of the stabbing of a French soldier in the throat shortly afterwards, because it was a copycat attack. And that just shows how our media is driven by video and sensationalism, uh, where it, if there was a video of that attack on a French soldier, then you would have heard a lot about it. Um, but it's all about presentation. Uh, and Ryan, do you, th do you think we're losing this battle in our fight against uh, radical uh, extre extremism and particularly um, not being able to confront this? Um, I don't know uh, if the same things happened in the aftermath of that um, awful terrorist attack that you had in, on the Boston Marathon and the aftermath of the Boston Marathon, because with our two countries, it's the first terror attack in the United States since 9-11, and uh, the attack on Lee Rigby was the first attack really since 7-7 uh, on the um, 7th of July 2005. Do you think we're entering into a new period of uh, terrorism, where we're seeing Islamists becoming more and more bold and, and uh, willing to carry out more audacious terrorist attacks? I think that the Al-Qaeda type Islamists, that specific element of them, uh, have always been determined to carry out an attack. That's always been the case. But I do think that we're reaching a level now where we're going to see an increasing number of attacks because, like I said before, simply because of mathematics. Now, as for what's happening in the United States and the reaction to this problem of what's inappropriately called homegrown extremism because it's not really homegrown, uh, I, I think that the Boston bombings um, at the marathon were just basically the wake-up call. Again, that was on videotape. There actually have been terrorist attacks on American soil besides the Boston bombings, but that was the dramatic moment when Americans had to realize that this is a severe problem and that this is something that we have to contend with. And one of the points I make is that over at clarionproject.org, we really zeroed in on how the ideology is what causes these attacks. So the Boston bombers, the mosque that they attended was actually linked very deeply to the Muslim Brotherhood. And that's something that we need to pay attention to, is this ideological infrastructure that leads to this type of anti-Western extremism that then causes terrorism. And um, also, I'd like to introduce you to my guest, uh, Ryan, uh, and that is Professor Alan Johnson, who's the editor of Father magazine. He also um, worked for... Um, the Home Office for a couple of years in confronting uh, uh, radical Islam and the dangers of it. Um, have you got a question for Ryan? 
for Ryan. Um, I think um, I'd be interested to know in the, in the aftermath of Boston, um, did anyone rethink what the problem was, Ryan? Did you get a sense of a, a soul-searching in American political culture or amongst the politicians or, or not? To be honest with you, no. Um, and that's because there's still this attitude that there's always going to be crazy people out there that are always going to do crazy things. And so your average American doesn't want to be concerned with it because they say, well, the chances are greater of me getting struck by lightning than being killed in a terrorist attack. So I'm not going to pay attention to it. There was a brief moment where the mosque that they, the bombers attended did receive some negative attention. And I was hopeful at that time to bring attention to the fact that this is an ideological problem. But um, that in the 30 second news culture that we deal with today, that just came and went. But I think that the bigger issue here, even bigger than the attack that happened in London, was what happened in Sweden with the riots that went on for several days. Because that indicates a trend. That's a much bigger problem that Europe's going to have to contend with. Uh, that can really cause Europe to disintegrate. And um, Ryan, you wrote a very interesting article recently talking about France's growing um, Islamist problem, uh, in which you say there are over 750 government-designated sensitive urban zones in France, referred to as no-go areas. And about 5 million Muslims live in these areas of France where the law enforcement doesn't exercise a divisive uh, control. Um, isn't there a great danger if we, we look at what's happened in London, we look at the riots that are broken out in Sweden, we look about this uh, uh, attack on uh, this French soldier in uh, Paris, uh, and look at the wider picture here, that uh, isn't there a great danger that uh, our, our societies across Europe are going to start to break up where we see this rise of uh, Islamism across Europe? And are our politicians, not only in Europe, but also in the United States, willing to confront this? In America, I don't think that they are very willing to confront it. But the problem here is the, the lack of assimilation. There was a study done on al-Qaeda terrorists and their profiles, and about 80% of al-Qaeda terrorists have this one common feature where they're completely separate from society. They're not assimilated at all into Western beliefs. And that's a problem that you're seeing throughout Europe right now, where you have low-income, Muslim-majority areas, primarily immigrants, that are very hostile to law enforcement. So law enforcement can come in and do something perfectly reasonable, like arrest someone or, God forbid, shoot someone. And the reaction of the community is to respond with violence, because even though they live in France or they live in Sweden, they view the police as essentially foreigners. And so they respond with violence, and then that is what causes riots to mm -hmm. go on for days on end. And this is going to happen across Europe. And what I'm also concerned about is that that then leads to an increase in the anti-Muslim extremists. And I'm sorry to say, I think you're going to see bloody street battles between people who just hate Muslims and are fed up with this and between the Islamic extremists that live in these no-go zones. And it, until that happens, uh, we, we, have, we just have a short period of time in order to stop that from happening. Um, interesting. I mean, I, obviously, I hope Ryan's um, timeline especially is, is wrong on that. I think there's some grounds for a little bit more optimism in the sense that the spectacular Al-Qaeda-style attacks have kind of stopped. It's been a long time since 7-7. This was the first, in their terms, successful attack in a very long time. So there's a, there's a good job that's been done by the security services in foiling plots. That, that's, that's the first thing to reassure people with. I think the second is that recently we've seen reasonably low-tech um, attacks conducted by relatively recent recruits. So it's, it's the, the marginal figures who, who are managed, recruiters are able to reach them, radicalize them, and set them, set them going. Um, that's not quite the same thing as the 9-11, 7-7, the Bali bombing, the I Madrid bombing. about two different and, things, actually. Yeah, and so on. I, I'll just finish the point. Um, so that's, that's a relative success, I think. I think the second is that it's easy for our attention to be grabbed by those um, Muslims who've engaged in these kinds of attacks. What, what I would urge people to do is also keep an eye on what I think is a real silent revolution, certainly in this country, which is increasing levels of civic participation by Muslims, joining political parties, joining NGOs, joining voluntary organizations, forming new kinds of organizations, um, Sisters Against Violent Extremism, Inspire, 
and the Quilliam Foundation and others. There's a real battle for the soul of the community going on, and it's by no means clear. In fact, I would say it's, it's not true that the, the radicals and the Islamists are winning that battle. I think they're losing that battle to the moderates. I think often our own intellectual culture and our politicians are very slow in supporting those moderate Muslims out there. I'll give you an example. For instance, a figure like Mehdi Hassan, who was editor of the New Statesman for some time, a political magazine in Britain, wrote a piece recently which simply said, look, we need to be honest with ourselves British Muslims have a problem with anti-Semitism. And he wrote this in the national uh, press, and it was very well received. He got a lot of good fe feeling for it, and I think it had a big impact. So the debate is going on, the argument is going on, and um, by no means are things lost. I don't think that's, that's true. I think um, we should be more, more hopeful than that, I think. Yeah. Uh, and Ryan, what's uh, your reaction to what uh, Professor Alan Johnson has just said? Well, I think the problem with these no-go go zones is really the, the more long-term threat. I agree with the analysis about al-Qaeda-type spectacular attacks that are really complex and therefore become easier to foil. The British intelligence and Western intelligence has done a good job of combating that. I'm frankly more concerned about these unassimilated areas that are hostile to outside authority, that quickly engage in riots, and is re really act as an incubator, not just for terrorism, but for extremism as a whole. Now, yes, there are very brave, moderate Muslims out there that are doing tremendous damage to the Islamists. But we have to look at who controls the mosques. We have to look at who has all the money and all the political power. And it's always groups that are tied to the Muslim Brotherhood. And that's the same problem that we have here in the United States, where you have a majority of Muslim Americans that want nothing to do with the Muslim Brotherhood. But if you look at the organizations that have the political power, and the ones that control the mosques and are able to mobilize the masses, they are unfortunately linked to the Muslim Brotherhood. So there is a struggle within the, the Muslim communities in Europe and in the United States. I would argue that it, it's a more difficult struggle for the moderates in Europe than it is in America. Um, but I, I think that we can't um, trick ourselves into thinking that the moderates are winning on the organizational level uh, because they just don't have the infrastructure. Uh, and Ryan, finally, um, I just very much want your views and your opinions about how much is outside influence, such as Saudi Arabia, such as uh, Qatar, actually having um, on radicalizing young, impressionable British Muslims and European Muslims across the continent of Europe and leading them into this dangerous path of extremism and terrorism? Well, I'm very happy that you mentioned the so-called ally of Gutter, and that's because the country's in the near future that are going to be really bankrolling the Islamist ideology is going to be Qatar and Turkey. We hear a lot about Saudi Arabia, Iran, um, and some of these other countries, but those are the real powerhouses right now. So Qatar is uh, investing a lot of money in these no-go zones I'm talking about in France um, and in building ties to the, into the Muslim communities that haven't really been absorbed into Western culture throughout Europe. They're subsidizing the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood throughout the entire region, even though they're supposedly our ally. And Turkey is doing somewhat of the same thing. Over at clarionproject.org, for example, we posted a pretty popular article about the fact that the Turkish government is building a $100 million mega mosque in the state of Maryland in the United States. And it's going to be the largest Islamic architecture in the Western Hemisphere, probably. And that, that's just an indication of how Turkey, which is governed by Islamists, uh, is trying to reclaim its position as the leader of the Muslim world. Uh, Ryan, I just want to thank you so much for, for joining us today on the Middle East Report. And thank you for your insights. Very valuable. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Thank you. Alan, I really want to, to discuss some of the issues really about the whole radicalization. Now, th we know that uh, the um, two uh, suspect uh, killers of uh, Lee Rigby um, come from Nigeria, they come from Christian uh, backgrounds and they converted to Islam. Um, what, is it that, uh, what is it that drives these people to go through this process of uh, radicalization and doctrine that actually leads to this hideous terrorist attack we saw on Lee Rigby? I think we are talking about a process, but we need to understand the process in the right way. It, it isn't a conveyor belt. And that's where I think we can get into some difficulties if we imagine that there's some conveyor belt that connects Islam to Islamism to jihadism. That absolutely is not true. What we see is something different. We see 
there's a connecting point between those three terms, Islam, Islamism, and jihadism, in, in the form of individual biographies, people who move from commitment to Islam, to Islamism, to jihadism. So uh, Islam is obviously the faith, the canonical text, the Quran, the Hadith, and so on. Islamism is something else. It's a politicized ideology which attaches itself to Islam and says the problem that Muslims have is that the religion has become corrupted and become westernized and we need to return to the pure Islam and to reject all the Western influences. So whether you're talking about Albana in Egypt or Sayyid Qutb or Khomeini in Iran or Kurdawi, who's a Muslim Brotherhood figure now, they have an ideology which is the world is separated into the house of Islam where Islamists are in control in the house of war, which is the also called jahiliya or barbarism. And th they mean by that where Islam doesn't rule. And they have a very black and white view of the world, and they take it further by saying that it's a religious duty to gradually make the house of Islam spread over the world. Now, you can have nonviolent forms of the Islamist belief, people who do think that, but think that the way we do that is by dawah or persuasion making the case for Islam as the best way to live your life. And you can have nonviolent forms of Islamism. Again, but there's a strain of people who say, I agree with everything you've said around the black and white nature of the world, the division of the world between where is Islam is in control and where Islam is not in control. I agree with the religious imperative that we have to expand the zone of the control and influence of Islam around the world but I want to do it in a violent way. So the jihadist is someone who takes that Islamist ideology and takes it another step further, who says, we're going to impose Islam now, and we're going to impose a very extreme and literal version of it, and we're going to use violence to do it. And that's jihadism, and that's, that's what we saw on the streets of, of Woolwich. Now, so there's no easy process from one to the other, but we need to be aware of the connecting points and we need to challenge at those points and make sure that nobody, or as few people as possible, make that journey from Islam to Islamism to jihadism. And, and what role can our governments play in this? Because uh, we, we've heard too much discussions um, by our political leaders, by our government, talking constantly in trying to reassure the public that Islam is a religion of peace. When we have here Tony Blair in writing in uh, Sunday's Mail on Sunday saying mud of Lee Rigby proves there is a problem within Islam. Well, I have to say, I think Tony Blair's right. I think it was a brave thing to say. It was an honest thing to say. But I think it gets us into the right place. He, he made a distinction. He said the problem isn't in Islam, in the sense of it, he, he made sure to say it's not in the DNA. It's not inevitable. Um, we get into very bad places if we think that, and we get into anti-Muslim places, and we need to move away from that. And he did that very well, I think, by saying it's not in Islam, but it's within Islam. There's, there's elements of Islamic theology, there's elements of history, which create some openings, some footholds, if you like, for the Islamists and the jihadists to get some grip and to recruit people, and we need to, to confront them. The British government's role, obviously, is very different. It can't engage in that direct theological um, battle of ideas uh, in the way that Muslims uh, have to do. But, but it can do a, a number of things which are important. I think, firstly, it can move away from and reject some old forms of what was called multiculturalism, which really did us no good. So multiculturalism is many different things around the world. I think the Australian model is pretty attractive, actually. It's the one I would go for. The British model for too long was a kind of laissez-faire, anything goes, every culture is as good as every other culture, every practice is your own personal business unless it's breaking the law, so who are we to get involved and so on. That, that left an open field for the Islamists to organize and to recruit, really without being contested at all. So that, we need to move away from that towards a version of multiculturalism which says, look, we have some core British values, we have some basic norms which we adhere to. There is a way we do things here in Britain, and that doesn't mean it's a narrow, old English way and so on. It can be very wide. It can be open to religious pluralism and so on and cultural difference. But nonetheless, it has its limits. There's a way we do things here, and we use our school system uh, to educate people into that way. We take great pride in it, and we try and make sure that people have a real feeling of identity and membership in the society. That leads on to the second point, I think, which is for too long, I think, we've been afraid of the word assimilation, thinking it was kind of oppressive. 
if we assimilate people, we're somehow denying them something or pushing ourselves onto them. I think that's wholly the wrong approach. I think assimilation is a good thing. I think uh, it's a very good thing, especially in light of what Ryan was telling us, that there, are no, there aren't any no-go zones. I don't think there are in the UK, by the way, although I accept that there are in France. I think it's, it's good that there are no no-go zones. It's good that people are, are fully integrated. It's good that people learn English. Absolutely. A, a great program would be simply to the, the, the mass subsidy of English language teaching. It would help a lot of Muslim women, for instance, to develop the kind of skills necessary to enter the labor market and to, to be fully participant in the society. So I think we should embrace multiculturalism, uh, assimilationism, and a certain form of robust multiculturalism. The third point I'd make is, is this. We need some cultural self-confidence in the UK. So as we react to something like Woolwich, I think the kind of reactions we saw on the screen from the ordinary people on the street were very healthy. Uh, some of the reactions on the day I thought were just awe-inspiring, the way that women would sh shield the body so that it couldn't be mutilated anymore. Other women were talking down the, the, the attacker and so on. There was a kind of bravery that we saw on the day itself, which I think then went Absolutely. missing in the days afterwards, in which I wrote a piece for the Daily Telegraph which said if you'd been asleep for the day of the killing itself and only woke up the next day, you, you would have been confused, you, you would have been understandable if you thought the EDL had, had beheaded somebody. Um, I got, hold no brief for the EDL whatsoever, but it seemed that people wanted to change the subject very, very quickly onto far-right extremism and the need to oppose it, which, which I think there is a need to oppose far-right extremism. But a reluctance to talk about the, the problem itself, that these killers shouted Alwa Akbar as they carried out their killing and claimed to be religiously inspired. And that, I think, is in part about a society which feels we must be to blame, it must be our fault if someone's done this. The worse the attack that they do simply reflects the worse our history has been. So it's almost impossible for the killers to ever get the kind of blame that they deserve sometimes from our intellectual culture. I think we need to change that. And we need to say, look, we're proud of ourselves. The kind of societies we've created here with the rule of law, religious freedom. A lot of Muslims I spoke to will tell you that it's easier to practice their faith here in, in, than it is in many Muslim countries around the world. Like for instance, if you're a, a Sunni Muslim, you don't have a single mosque in Iran, not one. If you're, if you're a Shia Muslim, you're going to be persecuted in, in, in other parts of the Muslim world. Everyone can worship here. We should be proud of that. And I think many British Muslims do identify with that, and they do identify with democracy and the rule of law in this country. And we should, we should have more self-confidence, I think, about saying those things and attracting to real membership, real emotional commitment to British society, uh, that everyone who lives here. Oh, absolutely. We've got a clip to go to now, and I very much want your comment on this one because I found this uh, clip very, very disturbing. Uh, we've got a clip to go to now, and this is a group of uh, Dutch teenagers talking about uh, the Jews and the Holocaust and Nazism. Maar om zes uur mocht ik nog niet opstaan, dus ik moest mijn nieuwsgierigheid nog bedwingen tot kwart voor zeven. Van papa en mama heb ik een blauw bloesje gekregen. En, uh... Mogen we heel even stoppen? Ja. Om even gewoon even met elkaar even hierover te praten. Uh, Benjamin, weet je wie Anna Frank is? Ja. Een uh, meisje die de oorlog heeft meegemaakt, de Tweede Wereldoorlog. Ja, en? En ze is Joods. En? Wat is gebeurd met haar? Ze is uh, vermoord. Door, door wie? De... Nee, ze is niet vermoord. Wat dan? Uh, drie dagen later was, uh, uh, was Wereldoorlog, Tweede Wereldoorlog afgelopen. Ja. Die, de, drie dagen later ja. stierf ze door tyfus. Aan de ene kant wat Hitler met de Joden heeft gedaan, dus zeg maar, ben ik wel mee tevreden, ja? moet ik eerlijk zeggen. Ja. Mee tevreden? Ja. ja. Ik ook eigenlijk. Ja? Eerlijk gezegd ja. ben ik daar... Wat uh, Hitler zei ooit, uh, hij had gezegd, ooit een dag gaat komen dat jullie mij gelijk gaan geven dat ik al die joden heb vermoord. Ja, en die dag gaat komen. Maar hoe zou ik gelijk geven dat hij heel Zit veel ik? kinderen en vrouwen... Ja dus, die zijn maar joods. Die haat voor Joden is gewoon zeg maar door, omdat ze gewoon uh, onschuldig zomaar gewoon uh, iemands land proberen af te pakken bij Gaza en maken ze ook heel veel mensen dood. Ja, dus dat daarom haat je Joden. Ja, dus. dat vind ja. ik niet kunnen. Dus je, jij vindt ook terecht dat Hitler miljoenen Joden afgemaakt ja. heeft? Nu worden ook miljoenen uh, Palestijnen. Nee, nee Palestijn. dat kan je niet zeggen, miljoenen Palestijnen. Ja, dat Van dat wie krijgen jullie dat mee? Eén vraag, haat u zelf Joden of niet? Nee. Vindt u het goed wat ze uh, niet doen? Natuurlijk. 
Oh, dus nee, nee, met, net, met, met, met Gaza. 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 Maar nee, dat heeft niks met Jodendom te maken. Jawel. Nee, ja. dat heeft met wereldpolitiek te maken. Wat, wie zijn het dan? Nou, er zijn ook heel veel Joden gewoon die tegen de politiek van Israël zijn. Heel veel Joden. Wat mij betreft, dat, uh, kon je het best wel alle Joden meteen afslachten. <laughs> nou, wat dus. <laughs> maar weten ja. jullie ook dat, dat er veel meer groepen mee mochten? Niet alleen de Joden. Ja. Het is geen mensen ook, volgens mij. Ja, ja. Moslims, ja, ja dat, mensen dat vond ik wel. het uiterlijk. Ja, het was dat, dat er weinig moslims toen wonen in Europa, maar... maar dat, zo, dat vind ik ook dan weer, hè, zeg maar. Wel slecht. Hoeveel Joodse vrienden heb jij? Ja, ik zeg er niet voor. Ken je een Jood in je leven? Nee. Nou, hoe kan je dan zoiets zeggen? Zonder iemand, zonder iemand ooit gekend te hebben. Hoe kan je Joden zoiets... hoeven niet te kennen om iets over hun te zeggen. Snap je? Zeg maar, ja, het is toch vrijheid van meningsuiting? Ja, het is vrijheid van meningsuiting. Ik ben ook voor een vrij meningsuiting. Maar ik ben echt erg geïnteresseerd hoe je zo'n idee gevormd hebt. Op basis waarvan? Op alleen maar internet? Ook, Net, uh, op, ja, ook gewoon. Of van de moskee? Of van... Ja, gewoon tussen vrienden ook. Met vrienden. Vooral islamitische vrienden? Ja. Voor de islam. Nou, ik heb ook Nederland... Dus jullie hebben gewoon zulke gesprekken onderling? Tuurlijk. En je hebt ook Nederlandse vrienden met wie ja, je gewoon die, die ook praat? niet Joden mogen. Ja? Ja. ja omdat... Ik heb zoveel Nederlandse vrienden tegen Joden. Ja. Waarom? Ze gebruiken zelfs... Heel onze school. Heel onze school mag geen Jood. Kom maar mee naar onze school. Ik meen het. Ook autochtone Nederlanders? Ja. ja. Dus jullie schelden elkaar als Jood, of? Ja. Ja, Jood is wel een school. Is wel een school, Ja. Ja, dat is eigenlijk ook een vraag. Mag ik het zo zeggen? Wa waarom Joods bij ons geld wordt is? Kijk, bijvoorbeeld... Uh, als je iemand uitschat, wil je hem het slechtste wensen, toch? Bijvoorbeeld kanker. Mensen schelden met kanker omdat je hem het slechtste wil wensen. Dus dat is ook met Joods. Joods is voor ons slechts, snap je? Daarom slecht, uh, schelden wij ons slechts uit. En dat is Joods. Joods, uh, ja, wij vinden Joods slecht. Snap je? Ja. Extreem, extreem. Hitler heeft baby's van zes maanden, twee maanden, van een maand. Dat vind ik het goed. Ja. Hoe kan je nou zoiets zeggen, Beetje? Beetje, hoe kan je nou zoiets zeggen? Ik ben echt geschrokken van jou. Ik heb gewoon begrip dat Hitler gewoon onschuldige mensen ter plekke doodgeschoten heeft. Ja, als Joden zijn, ja. Okay. Ja, als Joden zijn. Ja, maar je weet toch niet of ze als schuldig zijn? Nee, Hitler zei heel duidelijk dat ze gewoon niet pasten bij Arische ras. Dus dat was eigenlijk hun schuld. Was omdat ze niet behoorden tot Arische ras. Maar waarom zou zomaar Hitler Joden had, dan had hij vast wel een reden voor. Ja. Hij gaat toch niet zomaar een Jood doen? Welcome back to the Middle East Report. Uh, I found that sh uh, clip there extremely shocking and very, very disturbing. Um, Alan, I think sadly we're down to less than four minutes of the program, so it's gone very fast today. But I wanted to show that clip because I think there's a great deal of work that needs to be done urgently um, to stop these type of views like these du young Dutch teenagers have. Um, which are absolutely horrific and horrendous. And I never thought that here we are, 70 years on from the Holocaust, that young people could hold such views. Well, I, I was shocked too. I mean, I think we have a problem in Britain, but I, I don't think we have that problem. Certainly, um, I hope I'm right. I've never come across anything like that before. It was, it was, it was, it was horrendous. Um, as we were talking before about the article Mehdi Hassan wrote, we have a problem with anti-Semitism in the Muslim community. He meant um, casual racism against Jews, um, demonization of Jews and so on, a willingness to think of Jews as all controlling and so on. And that's real. But um, we don't have anything like that. In light of what we've talked about in the program, though, we do have to say that um, there is a problem within Islam, to quote Tony Blair again, um, whether it's Jews as, um, as they appear in the Hadith and in parts of the Quran as a the lad said Jews are evil. There's certainly a, a figure of the Jew within some of the canonical texts as a duplicitous figure, a figure of betrayal, a figure of um, impiety and so on. Um, there's this very famous hadith but which Bukhari is responsible for, which says that when the final hour comes, the trees will shout out, as a Jew hiding behind me, come and kill him. So, and that feeds right through into the Hamas Charta, which reproduces that hadith. That's a problem. There's a problem in the history itself, whether it's the slaughter of Jews when Muhammad was a, 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 the, the prophet engaged in conflict tribe against tribe, or whether it's uh, the kind of 
dimitude, so-called or second-class status given to non-Muslims, which Jews experienced, whether it's the Second World War and the Palestinian, the Mufti of Jerusalem forging an alliance with Adolf Hitler, forming a, 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 an SS brigade um, to fight Muslims, to fight alongside Hitler and so on, whether it's the Hamas Charter, all the way through to Morsi, the Egyptian president saying very anti-Semitic things recently. So there is a history there. It's by no means all of Islam. There's um, another story to tell, but there's a story to confront and be very honest about and for the leaders of that community to challenge. Alan, I just want to thank you so much for joining on today's Middle East Report. It's been a pleasure. And I want to thank you for watching today's uh, Middle East Report. Uh, it's been a very difficult program discussing these very, very difficult issues. But um, our hearts go out to the family of uh, drummer Lee Rigby, uh, who uh, they're suffering a great loss right now. Not only his family, but also his fellow soldiers. So let's play this song in tribute to drummer Lee Rigby. Let's pray for our armed forces. Let's pray for his family. And let's pray for peace and social cohesion that's needed in this nation and across Europe. And so thank you for watching today's uh, Middle East Report. <laughs> following the rain and there ain't no easy way to say it's happening again but i got the strangest feeling of the children in the street and i hope that i am wrong cause i hate to see them weep we got to learn Oh